and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Khalid Said Khan. He's the distinguished investigator of the Beatriz Galindo program of the University of Grenada, Spain, and he's an expert on systematic reviews. And he is going to talk to us about the integrity of clinical trials on improving research trustworthiness is essential for evidence-based medicine. So over to Professor Said Khan. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the college president for the invitation and the opportunity to speak uh, about the topic of uh, integrity of clinical trial. My plan is to give a little bit more introduction about myself so as to let you know of my background as a clinician and a trialist. Then uh, I will give some orientation. Uh, the orientation is important because uh, we generally accept that anything that passes through peer review and is published, well, we don't question that it may have some integrity problem. But during the COVID times, it has become clear that uh, there are issues. So I'd like to highlight some of those issues. But first, I give you something about my own life journey. I finished, I started medical school in 1983 in Karachi, Pakistan. Then having completed medical school, I worked for some time in Kenya. During this early years, I recognized that uh, research is highly important for professional development as an individual, but also for development of the profession. <clears throat> Having returned to Pakistan after my time in Kenya, I had the opportunity to have my first paper published, and this was in 1990. I subsequently trained in uh, epidemiology at uh, McMaster University in Canada, and then I spent nearly 25 years uh, living and working in the UK, where I had the opportunity to be research director at uh, two big hospitals, one in Birmingham and the other in London. And uh, at Queen Mary University of London, I was a uh, professor for 10 years. During this time, I had the opportunity to oversee research and receive and investigate some complaints about the conduct of research. And while I was editor of journal, for example, at the British Journal, I was chief editor. I also had the opportunity to receive and investigate complaints about articles that had already been published. And while I worked as a researcher, I undertook around two dozen randomized control trials myself recruiting over 10,000 people in total. So I have the relevant experience from the point of planning a trial, conducting a trial, overseeing the conduct of a trial, publishing a trial, as well as investigating complaints about integrity of trials. In 2020, I took the last plane that flew from London to Granada in order to start my academic life at University of Granada in Spain. And the day I landed, the next day started the quarantine of the COVID. And soon afterwards, I received a phone call from government of Pakistan to become member of the COVID research committee where I had the opportunity to work with Professor Javed Akram, who will be the speaker following my talk. And the experience of engaging in research during COVID time made me realize that there is a problem of integrity. And I invested the last four years in 
in the issue of integrity of clinical trials. <clears throat> so here you see an image of uh, my forthcoming book titled Integrity of Randomized Clinical Trials. It's going to be published by Taylor and Francis and will be available from December this year onwards. <clears throat> this presentation that I'm making, the content is presented in detail inside this, uh, this book. So let's just look at an overview. The, the, rand the randomized trial happens at a late stage in research translation. The randomized trial, particularly phase three trial, involves recruitment of patients. Now, I want to make this distinction clear. The word trial could also mean non-randomized studies of healthy individuals. But my presentation today is focusing primarily on randomized studies of patients and it is these kind of studies with which we are able to improve health policies and improve health outcomes. So I give you an example. You see from the 1950s onwards, at a time after the Second World War, when the whole world was experiencing, in general, economic, educational, and social growth and reform, the mortality for breast cancer was increasing year on year, decade after decade. But during this time, patients were also being recruited into randomized trials. So by the mid 60s, around 30,000 women had been randomized in trials of breast cancer. It's only after this critical large number of randomized data becoming available that the breast cancer mortality in women started to come down. So it's important to recognize that evidence-based medicine, which relies heavily on randomized control trials, is what underpins improvements in healthcare. However, we got to ask the question, as has been asked in many publications, how many clinical trials cannot be trusted? So the recognition that there are some fake papers in the literature is now, particularly during COVID time, recognized as a serious problem. So among 400 papers published concerning COVID, there have been seven, there have been seven retracted randomized control trials. This basically means that at a time when there was urgency and high relevance that science helps society to get out of the lockdown, there were people cheating in science for some reason, or making errors in their research, perhaps they were honest errors in some cases. And as a result, the science that came out, in fact, could potentially mislead the outcome. Now, there is some literature which shows, for example, that around 10 to 12% of scientists from Holland agree that in their own lifetime as researchers, they have either seen or themselves been engaged in some questionable research practices. And uh, a meta-analysis of uh, 16 studies on this topic shows that uh, in personal practice, scientists admit at a 2% level of engaging in some form of misconduct or questionable practice. And on observation of other colleagues, we're talking about 12 to 15% of uh, prevalence of uh, misconduct among misconduct or uh, questionable practice. And according to the world map 
of retracted papers, you can see that high numbers exist of retracted papers from the United States, from China, and, uh, and other countries, as you see, including our own region. And what is the prevalence of, of, uh, retract, of uh, misconduct in clinical trials? I have to say it is difficult to estimate because at the moment, the science of investigation of integrity itself is in its infancy. Now, looking at evidence-based medicine, it combines the art or judgment of practice with the published evidence. And with this definition, what we can say is that we have a belief system which we inherit through professional training, but this belief system need to be matched and backed by correct information. And unless the belief system is underpinned by correct knowledge, there is a risk that we could in fact be offering inferior or even dangerous care to our patients. If you look at the COVID times, you will know the story of the use of anti-malarials. It was only through randomized trials that it was possible to demonstrate that anti-malarials actually increase mortality. They do not decrease mortality. And in the anti-malarial story, there are several trials, including two that were following publication retracted. So, in the translation of research with the aim to improve healthcare outcomes, we go through the process of undertaking trials and systematic reviews of trials, and systematic reviews allow us the opportunity to remove the trials from our consideration, which have some integrity flaws. And this step occurs at the time when published literature is appraised. But really, we should be thinking about how we can stop this potentially fraudulent or integrity flawed literature from getting published so that it never comes into public circulation. So in the conduct of trials, we can think of the issue of responsible research conduct in two aspects. On the one hand, we have moral values or ethics and on the other aspect, we have professional practice or professional standard. Just like there is professional regulation of doctors and nurses and other health professionals, there's got to be professional regulation of clinical trialists. Unfortunately, so far, there does not exist a regulatory mechanism that is formal enough for clinical trials. In fact, I've heard many people say one of the few things that doctors can do without any training, oversight or regulation is conduct trials. Well, this shouldn't be the case. And I hope you will agree with me uh, as we go along through my presentation. This is a highly important uh, feature of uh, professionalism uh, in medical and healthcare practice. So responsible research conduct combines ethical values with professional standards, and through this we plan and conduct trial after approval by ethics committees and with consent from individual, with proper consent from individual patients, and that collected data is analyzed and then reported. During this process, there may be clearly irresponsible conduct. For example, the consent may not have been obtained correctly or properly. On the other extreme, there is, by the book, 100% professional research conduct. And then there is, in between, an area of gray. And the traffic light analogy is a useful way of thinking about uh, how this works. 
Now, if complaints are made and investigated, we may find honest errors or we may find deliberate misconduct. And if investigations prove deliberate misconduct, then papers can be removed or retracted or papers can, if honest errors are identified and data are genuine, then papers can be reanalyzed and potentially republished with some corrections. Uh, but you will see that there are many papers for which a complaint is never made. And because we know that the peer review and editorial system is not perfect, there is a possibility that in published literature, there remain trials that have integrity concerns, but they, are never, they never come to light because there are no investigations. So one of the areas, as I highlighted, is ethics approval. Researcher submits the proposal, committee assesses it, revisions are made, and finally approval is granted. And then ethics principles are applied in the process of obtaining informed consent. Now you may think that a trial published well, we must have gone through ethics approval. But look, even today, there is concern that some trials exist where ethics approval or consent has not been adequate. Now, once the approval and consent process is implemented, the trial itself need to receive some form of oversight, for example, through a trial steering committee where independent members give assistance or supervision to trialists, these independent members will not be named as authors in the paper, but they provide volunteer oversight to ensure that the published trial uh, will not have the kind of errors that I have been talking about. And then in some circumstances, it may be necessary to have data monitoring committees. For example, vaccine trials for COVID all had data monitoring uh, carried out during the course of the trials. When the trial is completed, obviously, then it has to go through reporting. And in this cycle, they go through peer review, revisions, and then rejection and resubmission, and finally there is acceptance. But at some stage, there could also be integrity concern raised, for example, during peer review or following publication. Now, when these concerns are raised, this, the concern may be based on, for example, the registration of the trial is not prospective, and this could be potentially an integrity flaw. But the complainant who makes the complaint obviously need to then leave the complaint with the investigating team to evaluate whether, in fact, the concern raised is uh, found or not found. Similarly, when systematic reviews are carried out, at the stage of study selection, reviewers may remove some published trials, even if they are not with expressed concerns. Certainly, they should remove the retracted trials. Then their extraction and data analysis may finally lead to a revised opinion about the research question by focusing entirely on those trials which do not have integrity concerns. With this background, I like to take you to where is all of this heading? Well, here you see an international multi-stakeholder consensus. This project was commenced in 2021. It was backed by Comstec, which is an organization that represents 51 states. The idea was that when there is backing of an organization like this, 
then in fact there is a possibility that a statement about clinical in trial integrity can be transmitted directly to education, research, and health ministries of countries so that it isn't just a published document that perhaps nobody will see. It should in fact directly help inform public health and research policies. So this project involved more than 30 experts from more than a dozen countries across all different continents of the world. And these experts came together to review the literature and to make recommendations for how clinical trial integrity should be maximized. It was subsequently published in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the proceedings have been presented on various occasions. This particular presentation itself is a form of a proceeding or presentation of these uh, integrity uh, statements. The statement has been republished in English in a journal in Pakistan, for example, and another one in the Middle East. And I would encourage colleagues from the Ceylon uh, uh, Society that if they would like to have this statement republished over here, then certainly we will collaborate with you to ensure that it can be republished and accessed by colleagues who undertake trials uh, over here. It has also been translated into Spanish so that the Spanish-speaking world can access this information. It is currently being translated into Arabic and French, and a Chinese version is already in the pipeline and will be published uh, before the end of this year. The data in the statement is publicly available and shared so that anybody who wants to reanalyze the data can double check what has been published. And this should become the norm in the future for randomized trials. The statement has advice that is general, but also about what is future research. But the key thing is that it has advice specifically about design and approval, about conduct and monitoring, and about reporting of protocols and findings, and also about how to deal with complaints made once the article has been published. So here is a summary of the findings. The trial should be prospectively registered. Its protocol should be published. The publication does not mean it must be published in a journal, but publication means it should be publicly available. And this is now possible to do in a formal way because of something called preprint. Almost all protocols can be made immediately available through the version called preprint, which carries its own digital object identifier. I believe alongside the protocol, the consent form and patient information should also be published. During the course of the trial, there should be monitoring of how the consent procedure is working. Uh, there should be monitoring of data if required for, for, for adverse reactions, if that is relevant to the question. You can imagine that there are some trials that are for exam examining interventions for the first time, and there are other kinds of trials that are examining reuse of a known intervention. If such an intervention is already known to be safe, perhaps it does not need the same way of in-depth monitoring of data as would be required for a new intervention. The statistical analysis plan should be published before the data are provided to the trialists for performing their analysis. And this should be publicly available. And on publication, there should be sharing of the trial data so that other people can independently check it. In fact, I strongly recommend that journals should reanalyze the data submitted to check that the results being presented in the published paper are in fact correct according to an independent analysis. These raw data should also be reused in individual patient data meta-analysis so that the final conclusion reached through systematic reviews is the correct conclusion. My time's nearly up. I conclude by saying that research-based practice 
is the most ethical way to practice health uh, medicine. The randomized trial provides the highest level of evidence. The trials must be ethical. They must respect the consent of the individual patient. There should be independent oversight. They should be reported transparently with data sharing. And with this, I bring my presentation to close. Thank you very much. I would be happy to take any questions if there is time. It's entirely up to you. Guys, usually for the plenaries, we don't have any questions. Maybe afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Khan, for an absolutely brilliant presentation on uh, something really important. Uh, integrity is absolutely uh, uh, essential. And if you don't have integrity in research, there will be the evidence is of no value. So thank you very much again. And if you could step across. Thank you.